great morning to gather together to celebrate the life of Walter Charles Conahan. My name is Charles Ayers. I'm pastor here at First Presbyterian Church, Marjorie and Walt's uh, church for, for many, many years. And Pat Hammond, associate pastor, she and I will be uh, celebrating um, Walt's life with you. We're gathered here in recognition of, of Walter and also to give witness to the resurrection to eternal life that is ours in Jesus Christ. Walt said when Pat visited him towards the end of his life, God had a role in everything I did. And uh, even though he has uh, left this earthly place, um, we're going to honor that and let God have a role in our time of celebrating his life as well. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, even though they die, they will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Come to me, all you who labor and are overburdened, and I will give you rest. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth and whose promise to each and every one who believe is eternal life. If you are able, if you would stand and sing one of Walt's favorite hymns, um, Be Thou My Vision 450. Let us pray. Eternal God, your love for us is everlasting. You alone can turn the shadow of death into the brightness of the morning light. Help us, O oh God, to turn to you with believing hearts. In the stillness of this hour, speak to us of eternal things so that hearing the promises in Scripture, we might have hope and be lifted above our distress into the peace of your presence. 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Our first scripture reading today comes from Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 through 8. Listen. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep, and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate a time for war, and a time for peace. And for Walt, a time to hang on to life, and a time to let go. Our second reading comes from Psalm 23. The 23rd Psalm has been a staple at funerals since the Civil War. It's a psalm of comfort, and a gentle reminder that the Lord is with us all the days of our life. So I would invite you to join me and let's say together the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valleys, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. As Chris and Dan play Amazing Grace, uh, allow those words to uh, soak deep into your own souls and give thanks for Walt's life.
I'm going to invite Jack Marsh to come up and lead us through this next part of celebrating Walter's life. Jack is a good friend of Walt. That's, he said, that's all the introduction I want. Just a good friend of Walt's. Marjorie Conahan, Christy Green, Ron Green, Heather Barthelman, thank you. Thank you for sharing your husband and your father and your grandfather with all of us and with countless others who are with us in spirit this morning. God, through his grace and by his love, extends to us precious opportunities in our lifetimes to come together in true unity. Unity that bridges generations embraces people of diverse backgrounds, people of different faiths, people with opposing ideologies from broad political spectrums. This worship service to celebrate Walt Conahan's life and legacy is one of those precious occasions. It is a God-given experience that we should treasure. So let us pause and savor this time together, and let it be forever embedded in our memories. So everyone, this is a little unusual for a funeral, but I want you to, I want, we need to take this in. So I want you to look to your left, and I want you to look to behind you, I want you to turn around, I want you to, I want you to see the people who have come here in support of this family, and to celebrate the life of Walter Charles Conahan. Just look around, look who's here. What an amazing gathering. What a wonderful celebration of Walt's life. And if you're able, I want you to stand. And I want you to greet each other warmly, just like Walt Conahan did here every Sunday morning. <laughs> Take your time. We're not in a hurry. Walt Conahan was universally loved and respected by everyone he touched, by everyone he encouraged, and because of everything he accomplished. You have affirmed that by your presence here and by the warm greetings you've just extended to one another. another. From six-year-old Muriel Jensen, where's Muriel Jensen? She's the youngest person here. And Larry Ritz, where's Larry? Right there. Larry is 95 years old. Think about the diversity and the full spectrum of people who were touched by this great man. What a great day this is. When Walt Conahan was diagnosed with cancer five years ago, the doctors re uh, reviewed his treatment op options and his chances of survival. I cannot lose, Walt said. I cannot lose. If the treatment is effective, I keep living. If it is not, I go to heaven. I, I cannot lose. A disciple of his faith, an optimist, an encourager, Walt Conahan is the most positive person I ever knew. He modeled for us how we should live, and how we should treat one another. And he taught us how to prepare for what he called the next go-round. Can't you just imagine him saying that, next go-round? He treasured each day, and he planned for the future just in case there might be some kind of miraculous cure or turnaround. Though he was in hospice care, and was given only a few weeks to live, Walt Conahan renewed his season tickets 
for Jackrabbits football. Hang on, there's more. The subscription to the full South Dakota Symphony Orchestra uh, classical series. And he bought two tickets to every Broadway show coming to the Washington Pavilion next season. So if Marjorie lets you borrow some of those tickets next year, next season, leave room for Walt, because he's going to be there cheering on his jackrabbits, and he's going to be applauding the incredible music of the South Dakota Symphony, and he's probably going to give a standing ovation to the performers at the Washington Pavilion. Walt Conahan was a statesman, a champion of integrity, bipartisanship, civility, and compromise, always consistent with society's best interests. On behalf of a grateful state and nation, Governor Dennis Dugard ordered today that the flags at the South Dakota State Capitol be lowered to half staff in Walt's honor. We, the friends and family of Walter Charles Conahan, join in celebrating Walt's life and legacy. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Two of Betty's and uh, my uh, favorite couples relocated to Sioux Falls in 2001. Walt and Marjorie moved from Brookings to be closer to their daughter and their granddaughter and other relatives. And Randall and Linda Beck were transferred here when Randall was hired as the uh, executive editor of the Argus Leader, one of my successors, actually. The Conahans and the Becks embraced this community, got involved, nurtured good friendships, and they have helped to make Sioux Falls a better, more compassionate, just, and peaceful place to live. Perhaps because of their mutual appreciation for good journalism and good government, Walt and Randall hit it off. Here to tell the rest of the story, is Randall Beck, the retired publisher of the Argus Leader. Randall is a journalism heavyweight. He sits on the prestigious Pulitzer Prize board at Columbia University. Randall Beck. You can learn a lot about someone's life by watching how they die. It's been my very great privilege over my life to walk closely with two men in the final chapter, the very final chapter of their lives. The first, my dad, looked me in the eye a, a few months from the end. And as was his way, he bored into me and he said this, I have tried to teach you how to live. Now I'm going to teach you how to die. My very dear friend Walt never actually said that to me in the final months of his life. But Walt didn't have to. The way Walt's eyes lit up as I sat next to him in those final months the way his deep faith in God shaped our every moment together. And most memorably, the way I walked away from those all too brief chair and then bedside conversations vastly more encouraged, more cheered than when I'd come. All spoke, all still speak to a life well and richly lived. All reflected this man's, Walt Conahan's, boundless optimism, his profound kindness, and his deep humility. Even from the beginning, for me, Walt sort of snuck up on me. As the new editor nearly 14 years ago, I found myself the beneficiary 
of relationships with a small handful of men of advanced age and advanced wisdom who took it on themselves to teach this new guy a thing or two about South Dakota and a thing or two about life. Over the years, Walt, to my very good fortune, was one of those men. Over that time, I came to draw on Walt's storehouse of knowledge about South Dakota politics, about journalism, about his beloved jackrabbits of South Dakota State University, and, well, almost anything within the confines of this great state. He offered story tips without strings, commentary on myriad developments of civic public life, and without fail, without fail, praise for the achievements of the newspaper staff I proudly directed. Though those words of encouragement from Walt were never uttered falsely. With all that, his mark on my life went well beyond our shared passion for good journalism and public affairs. What I saw early on in my encounters with Walt, along with his dear wife, Marjorie, <clears throat> was a man very much at peace with himself, a man content. I noticed, Jack alluded to it, everyone has and will, that he had this perpetual smile on his face. He always seemed more interested in my own welfare than his own. And his insights were shaped by an uncommon tendency to think the best of others. In our cynical age, those like Walt who lead lives of quiet dignity, ever uncomfortable blowing their own horn, are more and more counter-cultural. In the Gospels, we read about a man named Nathaniel, some call him Bartholomew, whom Jesus called as a disciple. We read in the book of John that Jesus saw Nathaniel approaching, and he publicly called him out as a, quote, man without guile, a man without guile. Nathaniel apparently was an honest man by character and by temperament incapable of deceit. Walt Conahan, in the way he lived his life and the way he made his mark on me, was truly a man without guile. Just like my own father, Walt Conahan taught me how to live and how to die. I will always be grateful for both lessons. At some point, we all have to confront our own mortality and come to terms with who and what we really are. I think Walt Conahan, my very dear friend, did that a very, very long time ago. The man I knew, the one who influenced my life, whose memory will continue to inspire me, truly embodied the spirit of Micah 6 8. In that Old Testament verse, the prophet really succinctly summarizes the important things in life. And he says, quote, And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Well done, Walt, my friend. Well done.
when Walt took the helm at the uh, SDSU Foundation in 1978, he reached out to the student body president, an extroverted 22-year-old political science and history major named V.J. Smith. They clicked from that uh, first day when they met at the new Alumni Center up in Brookings. After all, they were both from McPherson County, and Walt also had been the SDSU student body president about 25 years before. Their relationship has blossomed and matured for 37 years. When V.J. Smith joined the SDSU staff as assistant athletic director in 1990, it was Walt Conahan who helped conduct the job interview. Years later, Walt was delighted when B.J. Smith took over as executive director of the SDSU Alumni Association from 1996 to 2006. Walt Conahan remained B.J.'s champion, and because of a shared love for their alma mater, they became two of South Dakota State's most effective ambassadors. Walt Conahan's friend and fellow alumnus, the pride of Eureka, South Dakota, B.J. Smith. Walt Conahan is a big man on campus. <laughs> For the record, I didn't misspeak. I have phrased that statement in the proper tense. Walt Conahan continues, yes, continues to be a major figure in the life of South Dakota State University. Walt, the pride of McPherson County, Enrolled at South Dakota State College in 1947, he declared a major in printing and journalism, which would take five years to complete. Following a pattern set while growing up in Leola, Walt was never one to sit on the sidelines. He was always in the arena, making things happen. Simply stated, Walt was a doer. In addition to his studies and membership in a multitude of organizations, he was editor of the school newspaper, elected student body president, and was the first weary willy in the history of South Dakota State. For those of you not well versed in jackrabbit history, weary willy is a bum <laughs> who is the personification of Hobo Day, SDSU's annual homecoming celebration. In 1950, Commercial Air Service came to Brookings. As part of rolling out its marketing campaign, Western Airlines contacted city and university officials wanting dignitaries to fly from Huron, or from, to fly to Huron, and then back to Brookings. Walt was one of the two students selected to go on the trip. He boarded the plane, went to Huron, and before he came back to Brookings, he transformed himself into a hobo. And when he got off the airplane, he was wearing ragged clothes, carrying a knapsack, and waving to the 600 fellow students who came to cheer him on. That figure represented almost half the student body at the time. Oh, how I would have loved to have been in the, at the airport that day to see Wall come off that airplane and greeted, be greeted in such a fashion. Walt was a man with, with a million stories, wasn't he? Allow me to share with you part of a note Walt wrote to me on March 30th, 2014. It was a long note, so I'm just gonna make it short. Later, when I was beginning journalism, George Phillips, his instructor, put me to work doing sports publicity for the college. I did the sports publicity position which provided $1.50 an hour, covering games and included telephoning results to various newspaper and radio outlets, and something, sometimes sending stuff by telegram, a story to a game which the paper had requested. Anyway, that's the job that became a permanent part of the university's sports administration and to which Ron Lenz gave such devoted and excellent service for many years. 
VJ, I'm sure I have bored you with all of this. Do you see what Walt did there? In typical modest Walt Conahan fashion, he tried to downplay the fact that he was the first sports information director at South Dakota State University, and he did it as a student. Instead of saying he was the first person, he lavished praise on Ron Lenz, who would follow him many years later. Now, the people of the Brookings area got to see a column from Chuck Cecil this week. And I asked Christy if I could repeat part of it. And she said, go for it. But Chuck and Walt were great friends. And in this story, Walt, or Chuck, talks about Walt's fictitious friend, Nick Perkowski. Cecil wrote, the two got together when Walt was the SDSU Collegian Sports Editor in 1949. In the photographs selected to run in the sports section of the student newspaper were many football and basketball game shots. Often Walt's pictures included athletes in the background who were either just beyond the reach of the camera's flash, so were simply blurry, dark images, or were not completely in the picture. Walt's humor kicked in. Just for the fun of it, he placed his tongue firmly in his cheek and credited those dim figures or arms or legs flailing near, nearly out of view as belonging to a make-believe person he called Nick Perkowski. <laughs> Walt's Nick Perkowski appeared in more collegiate pictures in 1949 than any other athlete on the planet. After the 1949 Augustana football game, Walt identified the players whose jersey numbers were readable, but added, Nick Perkowski can be seen just to the right of Eldon Keller's leg with his head out of the picture. <laughs> Under a photo of the Jackrabbit Coyote Hobode game, Perkowski again made the picture page, quoting, Nick Perkowski's leg and arm can be seen just to the right of the picture. Every week, every sports picture, picture included some of Nick Perkowski. Collegian readers followed Perkowski's prowess through the seasons, even though college registrar Dave Doner had no idea who Nick Perkowski was. <laughs> Can't you just hear Walt laugh that famous laugh? God fashioned somebody real special when he made Walt Conahan. And I suspect for the past week, God has been walking around with a jackrabbit flag because Walt convinced him he would be a good idea. <laughs> and I'm thinking that Walt has already corralled a bunch of USD alumni up there, and they are singing ring the bells for South Dakota because he told them it was a USD song. <laughs> and Walt just smiling, leading the chorus. On Hobart Day 1977, Walt and Marjorie were back in Brookings for a visit. Daughter Christy was in her first year at SDSU. During the President's luncheon on Saturday morning before the game, President Sherwood Berg approached Walt and asked him to consider becoming the first full-time executive director of the South Dakota State University Foundation. As Chuck Cecil told me, he was the perfect guy at the perfect time. For 13 years, Walt poured his heart and soul into the job. The assets of the SDSU Foundation grew from $1 million to $13 million. The first major scholarship drive ever encountered or conducted at our university, aptly named Leaders for Tomorrow, was launched, and all alumni were contacted by mail and phone. And it didn't matter if you gave $1,000 or $10. Walt would always jot a handwritten note at the bottom of the letter. He always made you feel like you were his very close friend. Walt's longtime SDSU colleague, Jeff Nelson, told me, I don't know of too many schools that had an ambassador like that. Walt's network of friends greatly expanded the scope of the foundation. The board, which was typically a group of local business people, 
began to welcome new members from throughout the country. The foundation grew and so did the number of recipients for scholarship awards. I can't even begin to imagine the number of young people whose lives have been impacted by Walt's efforts, even to this day. And I know that many of those now middle-aged alums are giving back to the university as a way of showing their appreciation for what was given to them. It's the circle of life. Chuck Cecil is right. Walt was the perfect guy at the perfect time. As I close, I want to focus on Walt's laugh, that wonderful, genuine laugh. It was as humble as he was. It was infectious, and you laughed with him. It drew you in and made you want to know him better. It was a signature mark of a happier, happy warrior who had no enemies. The tireless soul who loved life and was driven to make things better for the rest of us. So I'll miss the laugh. But the guy who owned the laugh, he'll always be the biggest man on campus. Because uh, we are both former newspaper men, Walt and I weren't shy about uh, quizzing one another. And to observers, our conversations uh, may have appeared to have been mild inquisitions. Uh, Walt and I preferred to think of uh, ourselves as politely nosy. You know, Walt was uh, a curious man. Many months ago, I asked uh, Walt a simple question. What motivates you? Walt seemed caught off guard. He felt that he fumbled the answer, and I never pursued it further. Well, something extraordinary happened uh, last week during one of my uh, visits with Walt. Walt had been sleeping uh, when I arrived at the house. We had a good uh, but uh, disjointed conversation. He was understandably exhausted, and he drifted off to sleep now and then. At one point, Walt awakened briefly, briefly, and without prompting, Walt answered the question that I had posed long ago, but that I had forgotten. You asked what motivates me, Walt said. Service, that's what motivates me. And then Walt fell back asleep. That is the correct answer, of course, and we all know it. Yet Walt was so modest that he had to give it a lot of thought. Here to talk about Walt Conahan's distinguished service to his beloved nation and state is John Thune, South Dakota's senior United States Senator, Senator Thune. prairies of South Dakota have produced some wonderful people over the years that have been involved in public life of our state and nation. But none were finer, kinder, nicer, wiser, more genuine, more humble than Walt Conahan. We've never had anybody who has graced the public square in our state that possessed the kind of qualities that Walt possessed. Walt really was too good for politics, <laughs> you know? <laughs> politics uh, didn't deserve someone of his quality. But for Walt, it wasn't about politics. It was about service. And that's what we're here to celebrate today. We mourn his passing but we celebrate his life and his service. And Marjorie, and Christy, and Ron, Heather, family, our hearts go out to you at this time of sadness and loss. Walt was a wonderful husband and father, and we all know that you will miss him dearly. 
It's my privilege, though, this morning to be able to reflect for a moment on a man of great character, a man of many talents, and a man of many friends. I'd also like to reflect for a moment on what it meant to Walt to be a public servant. In short, it meant a lot. As Jack Marsh just mentioned, it meant everything. From the beginning of his career, Walt became committed to public service, and he never relented. With his parents back in Leola, he served the town and farm families at his parents' cafe. And with his family, he reached out to many in McPherson County who were struggling during the Great Depression. One day, Walt's father came down from their apartment above the family cafe and told the family that Japan had bombed Pearl Harbor. It wasn't long before Walt was literally in the service. Walt joined the Army to fight for his country, and he ended up in the Philippines helping that war-torn place emerge into a new democracy. As soon as he returned to the States and enrolled at South Dakota State University, he immediately became involved in public service. In fact, as has already been mentioned, Walt may be the only person in SDSU history to become student body president and editor of the college newspaper and weary will for hobo days. SDSU, that's the trifecta. After his time at SDSU, Walt's service was focused on newspapering. He collected the news in Clear Lake for the folks in Duell County before going home to Leola to help his mother with the cafe after his father had passed away. But once again, public service called. In this case, it literally called on the telephone. At home in Leola, Walt was called by East River Congressman Harold Lovery of Watertown. Lovery wanted Walt to work on his staff, and Walt couldn't say no. Of course, during the 1950s in South Dakota, the figure who dominated the political scene was Senator Carl Munt of Madison. And it wasn't long before Senator Munt was calling Walt and offering him a job working on his staff. For 14 years, Walt helped run the office of one of the most powerful people in Washington, D.C. And when I say run the office, I do mean run the office. Walt had to guide the Munt office through some difficult days. In 1969, a stroke left Senator Munt highly disabled. And so for three years, Walt and the rest of the Munt staff had to manage the affairs of the Senate office. It was a trying time, and all South Dakotans can be grateful that Walt was there to look out for our state. During those trying times, my good friend Jim Abner from Kennebec was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Jim had a great eye for talent, and it didn't take him long to call Walt and to ask him to come to his office and serve as his chief of staff, which Walt did. The many friends, colleagues, and staffers of Jim Abner only remember Walt with the greatest affection. He holds legend status among the Abner office. And they remember how much Walt did to prepare Jim for his ascension to the United States Senate in 1980. When Walt left Jim's office to return to his beloved SDSU to run the foundation, Jim was able to help Walt as Walt embraced another form of service. When Walt ran for the state legislature from Brookings, Jim came to help him campaign, and it was successful. Walt served three terms in the state Senate and did his utmost to watch out for the interests of SDSU and Pierre. All this to say that Walt understood the importance and virtue of public service. Walt had a dedication to citizenship and the public good, or what the Greeks called res publica, or what we here in South Dakota call getting involved, pulling your weight, and not sitting on the sidelines. The Greeks defined idiocy as the refusal to get involved the avoidance of the public square, the unwillingness to serve the republic. We can all see that Walt embodied the ancient Greek virtue of public service, of citizenship, committing oneself to serving the republic. I think this quality is especially strong in many of the kids of our small towns. We think of it when we think of some of the figures in Walt's life, T.R. Burgess, the editor of the Clear Lake newspaper who first hired Walt out of college, Harold Lovery of Esteline, Carl Munn of Madison, George McGovern of Avon, Jim Abner of Kennebec. 
and Walt's political hero, Dwight Eisenhower of Abilene, Kansas, and of course, his dear wife, Marjorie Dean of Lemoore, North Dakota. And of course, we think of it when we think of Walt Conahan of Leola, South Dakota, and his impressive career of service. Walt was in great company during his long and distinguished life. And we know for certain he's in good company now. Walt Conahan was chief of staff for then freshman Congressman Jim Abner when the Arab-Israel War broke out in October of 1973. Abner, being Lebanese-American, was inundated by both the Arab community and the Jewish community. Each demanded that he take a position. Abner had no real foreign policy experience, so the congressman reached out to a bright young man he knew and liked, a recent Augustana College graduate from Clark, South Dakota, who had just moved to Washington to pursue his master's and a doctorate from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Despite his own limited experience, graduate student John J. Hamry was hired as a part-time foreign policy advisor in Abner's office. Hamry was assigned to work under Walt Conahan. Quote, Walt had to oversee all of us young staffers, Hamry told me earlier this week. Walt had to make sure that we were focused and productive, keeping us in line not to commit Jim Abner to something without a disciplined review. Walt never confused himself with Jim Abner. He knew his role was to help Jim be a good member of Congress. He made sure I understood that and understood my responsibilities. Walt and Marjorie also took me under their protective wing personally. They invited me into their home and gave me a feeling that I was home. So this is what I learned from Walt Conahan, says John Hamry. Number one, the importance of loyalty. Number two, the importance of being supportive of a boss and not putting him at risk through my own impetuous actions. Number three, the grandeur of public service and the obligation we had to the American public. Number four, the spirit of nurturing grace Walt Conahan ex extended to all of us. For these reasons, John Hamry said, I consider Walt Conahan the most important person in my professional life, end quote. Well, John Hamry eventually earned his master's and his doctorate from Johns Hopkins University. He left Abner's office for larger opportunities in federal service and ever greater staff leadership responsibilities in the U.S. House, in the U.S. Senate, and the Department of Defense. By applying the lessons he learned from Walt Conahan, John Hamry has done well, extremely well. John Hamry served in the Clinton administration from 1997 to 2000 as Deputy Secretary of Defense for the United States of America. That is the number two position in the Pentagon. Today, John Hamry is one of the world's preeminent experts on international affairs. Since leaving the Pentagon 15 years ago, Dr. Hamry has been President and Chief Executive Officer of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, which is among the most respected and trusted independent think tanks on the planet. John Hamry regrets that he cannot be with us today in person. He's in Asia on an international trip. So he joins us by video, Dr. John Hamry. Marge and Christy and all of Walt's friends. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you today. Walt was 
such a, an important, pivotal figure in my life, and I wish I could be there. Unfortunately, uh, travel obligation is taking me out of the country. I'm, I'm sorry. So I, I want to be here this way, if I can. I'd, I'd like to share with you a story. Uh, it's a story that comes from the book of Genesis, and it's about uh, Abraham and his conversation with God about Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember the story. Um, Sodom was a wicked place, full of evil people, and God said he wanted to destroy Sodom. Abraham came back and he said, God, I understand, but what happens if there are 50 righteous people who live in Sodom? Would you destroy those 50 righteous people in your anger? And God reflects and says, okay, all right. I will not destroy Sodom if you can find 50 honest people, good people. Abraham, who's kind of a, <laughs> a uh, negotiator, said, well, but God, what happens if there are 40 righteous people? Certainly with just 10 fewer, you wouldn't destroy God, uh, Sodom for that. Okay, okay, God says, all right. Well, how about 30? And then he goes about, how about 20? And finally, they get down to the bottom line. Uh, God says, if you find 10 righteous people who live in Sodom, I will spare the city. Well, we know how that story ends. Uh, there were not 10 righteous people who lived in Sodom, and Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. Now, the rabbinic fathers took this story, and they turned it upside down. They said, you know, surely the world is just as wicked today as it was then. So this must mean that there are 10, at least 10 righteous people who live among us who are saving the world from destruction. I think Walt Conahan was one of those 10. Walt was a man of enormous integrity, a good man, a man who always saw the best in what people could become, not what they were, but what they could become. I saw him build a staff and give them hope and direction and enthusiasm. Uh, he certainly transformed my life. He gave me a conviction that good government makes everything better. That was Walt. Walt was a man of conviction and courage and honesty, gentle humor, uh, and a, the kind of person that would bring out the best in all of us. Uh, I'm now too old to be spending all my energy on sadness. I only have enough energy left for joy. And I will always celebrate Walt Conahan. What a wonderful man. What a great gift he was to all of us. He's, uh, the good Lord gave us a replacement so that Walt could go home. And Walt's now home. Thank you for all, all of you for letting me be with you this way. I'm sorry I can't be there. But you know my heart is with all of you. Marge, Christy, your families, your friends. Uh, take joy in knowing this wonderful man. Uh, this is not a day of sadness. This is a day of great joy. Thank you. This is not a day of sadness. This is a day of great joy. Indeed it is, John Amory. Indeed it is. Walt said that it was his family that brought him the greatest joy and most fulfillment in life. Here's exactly what he said, and you can hear him. Their examples are such that I would like to think that I am following them and their examples, following their delight and service to others, following their outgoing demeanor and that type of thing. 
their general loving approach. The family, said Walt Conahan, is the most significant thing in my life. Walt had enormous affection for his family, rightfully so. He spoke of his deep love, appreciation, and respect for Marjorie, his beautiful bride of 57 years, for his remarkable superwoman daughter, let's just say it, Christy Green, for his son-in-law and best pal, Ron Green, and he expressed immense pride in Heather Barthelman, his multi-talented and adventurous granddaughter. Our friend Walt Conahan was also humble to a fault. Somehow, he got the impression that he was head of a small family. Well, Walt, we are gathered here in your honor this morning to prove you wrong. You and Marjorie have a huge family. Just look around. Just look around. All of us and our families join with your families, Marjorie. And we are all proud to be Irish today and to all be Conahans. I am pleased to introduce their dear, dear daughter, the daughter of Walt and Marjorie Conahan, Christy Green. I marvel at my good fortune of being Walt and Marjorie's daughter. I've been blessed with years of observing my dad's well-lived life and what it means to make the choice to live joyfully regardless of the circumstances. In each season of life, he adapted to the situation with good humor, a positive attitude and acceptance. When my dad was 27, his father Perry died unexpectedly. He and his brother Lee made an agreement to each spend a year working in the family restaurant, temporarily giving up careers they had embarked upon and careers they truly enjoyed. My dad watched over and cared for his mother Nina through her remaining years. When Lee died in 1997, it was a great loss for my dad. However, he has enjoyed watching Lee's grandsons grow up to be wonderful young men. And two of Lee's children, Kay and Carrie, are here with us today. My dad grew up near many of his cousins, some of whom are here today as well. He had wonderful memories of spending time on your family's farms. My dad also had a great love for my mother's parents, Ed and Violet, as well as the rest of my mom's family, some of whom are here today as well. My dad's greatest joys were my mother Marjorie, myself, my husband Ron, who my dad so fondly referred to as his pal, and of course, Heather, who he loves so dearly. When I think of my dad, the word delighted comes to mind. He was delighted to see you. He was delighted to share your company and delighted for you when good things came your way. My dad seemed delighted in the way his own life played out. My dad enjoyed the written word. He sent notes of congratulations, notes acknowledging the impact a person had in his life, telling someone how much he meant to them, or thanking someone for a kindness. Many of you were recipients of those precious notes. He never passed up a chance to share an encouraging word with others. My dad had strong convictions that wrongs should be righted, that we should help our fellow man, that we should treat others with respect, and that we should be thankful to live in the United States of America. When my dad asked how you were, he was sincerely interested if there was something he could do to help you, 
he wanted to. I think that's why Rotary was so important to him. Their motto is service above self. My dad was interested in finding out about a person and enjoyed making a connection. He'd ask you where you were from or if he knew someone with the same last name, if you were related. <laughs> Once he formed a relationship with you, he remembered details of what he was told because he really listened to you. He was interested in what you had to say. Over the last few years, there were days when he had pain from the cancer that had spread to his bones. Yet every day seemed like a good day to my dad because that was the choice he made. While he was confident his eternal home would be heaven, he tried every treatment he was offered because he wanted more time with us. Since my parents moved to Sioux Falls in 2000, they have been embraced by our closest friends, our heart group. Rick and Glennis Hall, Orrin and Linda Elwine, and Jack and Betty Marsh. We've celebrated holidays, birthdays, and ordinary days together. We consider ourselves friends who chose to be family and my dad had a great love for you. My parents' Christ Care group from this church, Lynn and Jerry Atchison, Sally and Gary Calm, and Mel and Ron Roos were great support to my dad throughout his illness. Each of you who honors us by being here today, by serving as a pallbearer or speaking about my dad, held a special place in his life and his heart. I'd like to recognize Jack Marsh, who formed a bond with my dad that has been a treasured relationship for both of them. Jack recognized the gift that my dad was and has preserved his legacy in many ways, especially in the 2013 interview and with today's celebration. My humble dad always seemed surprised that we wanted to glean as much information as we could from him we knew he held the key to so much rich history that we want to preserve. But it wasn't always grand projects with Jack. It was the countless acts of kindness that made my dad's last months so meaningful. As many of you know, in these last months, my dad's physical condition declined so that he needed help with most things. In spite of his dependence on others, he remained patient and appreciative. He never failed to say, thank you for everything you do for me. I appreciate all of it. One of the gifts of his last months has been that everything was able to be said and done, and we could simply savor our days together. Just as my life began feeling loved and secure, my hope is that as his life ended, he felt the same loved and secure. My dad, Walt Conahan, was an extraordinary man and father. And until we meet again, we'll hold you close in our hearts.
when your sweet lilting laughter like some fairy song and your eyes twinkle bright as can be you should laugh all the while and at other times smile and now smile a smile for me when Irish eyes are smiling, sure it's like a born in spring. In the lilt of Irish laughter, you can hear the angels sing. When Irish hearts are happy, happened 57 years ago, didn't it? <laughs> Those Irish eyes smiling. The New Testament scripture that has been chosen um, by the family, um, first from John chapter 4, this is out of a larger piece of scripture with Jesus talking at the woman at the well. And uh, he asks her something to drink, and she says, you know, who are you to talk to me? And the conversation goes on, and he says, if you knew who I was, you would ask for living waters. And she says, you don't even have a bucket. How can you get the waters? Um, and then to uh, her final inquiry, Jesus says to her, um, everyone who drinks of this well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them spring of water gushing up to eternal life. You've heard all the stories. You carry many more of those stories in your own heart and mind. You know that Walter is one who drank from the well that is the spring of water that gushes up to eternal life. He is one who has been able to bring to us, because of his faith in Jesus Christ, a sense where of, uh, we walk away from him and feel like we've been refreshed, even if we've gone to offer that refreshment. We feel like we've been refreshed. Walter drank, he received the water that has brought him to eternal life. Jesus says when he was about to be taken from his friends, set your troubled hearts at rest, trust in God always, trust also in me. There are many dwelling places in my father's house. If it were not so, I should have told you. 
for I am going there on purpose to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I shall come again, receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. As people of faith, we believe that a person's last breath here on earth, their next breath is in heaven. Walter's already taken those breaths, deep breaths, deep breaths without cancer, deep breaths without weakness, deep breaths and coherent thought and language again, and uh, up there, I'm sure, conversing and sharing all the things that made Walt Conahan who Walt Canahan was with all those who have gone before. That room has been prepared and he has taken up residence in it. No question about it. The Apostle Paul, when he was thinking about life and death issues, his own says this, if in face of this, what is there left to say? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not hesitate to spare his own son, but gave us up for us all. Can we not trust such a God to give us with him everything else that we need? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble or pain or persecution, can lack of clothes and food, danger to life and limb, threat of force of arms? No. In all these things, we win an overwhelming victory through him who has proved his love for us. I have become absolutely convinced that neither death nor life, nor messenger in heaven nor monarch on earth, neither what happens today nor what might happen tomorrow, neither a power from on high or a power from below, nor anything else in God's whole world has the power to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why I'm able to say with deep conviction that a person's last breath here on earth, their next breath is in heaven because that love sustains us from this life into the next and for eternity. Walter has loved well and now is being well cared for in that room that had been prepared for him and the love that God will always look upon him with. I invite you to remain seated, but uh, sing hymn number 819, Be Still My Soul.
And let us pray. God of grace, in Jesus Christ you have given us a new and living hope. We thank you that by dying Christ destroyed the power of death and that by rising from the grave he opened the way to eternal life. Help us to know that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from your love. Love never ends. O God, before whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. Especially, O God, we thank you for your servant, Walt, for the gift of his life, for the grace you have given him, for all in him that was good and kind and faithful. We thank you, Almighty God, for Walt's gentle nature, for his unassuming presence and his incredible humility. And especially, God, we thank you for Walt's love for his family. We thank you, God, that for Walt, death is past and pain is gone, and he has now entered the joy you have prepared. Give us faith to see beyond touch and sight some sure sign of your kingdom. And God, where vision fails, help us to trust your love a love which never fails, and a love that never ends. Now hear us, Almighty God, as we come together as a community of faith, and we say together with one strong and sure voice the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. One of the devotional books that Walter had by his bedside was a, a little book called Jesus Calling. And on April 14th, um, four days before Walter's death, um, there was a particular reading that was meaningful to him. Uh, Christy read it to him, and he said, read it again. She read it again, and then later in the day, she, he said, would you read that to me again? It's written as if Jesus is speaking into a person's life. And so let these words speak into your life as well. Heaven is both present and future. As you walk along your life path holding my hand, you are already touching the essence of heaven, nearness, to me. You can also find many hints of heaven along your pathway because the earth is radiantly alive with my presence. Shimmering sunshine awakens your heart, gently reminding you of my brilliant light. Birds and flowers, trees and skies invoke praise to my holy name. Keep your eyes and ears fully open as you journey with me. At the end of your life path, is an entrance to heaven. Only I know when you will reach that destination, but I am preparing for you each step of the way. The absolute certainty of your heavenly home gives you peace and joy to help you along your journey. You know that you will reach your home in my perfect timing, not one minute too soon nor too late. Let the hope of heaven encourage you as you walk along the path of life with me. I would invite you to stand as we say together the prayer of commendation.
Into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant and friend, Walter. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of eternal peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. Amen. South Dakota Public Broadcasting has produced a one-hour special on the life and legacy of Walt Conahan. And before you leave today, we invite you to take uh, one of the DVDs that are uh, at the back of the sanctuary. On behalf of Walt Conahan's family, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for being with us today. And uh, we want this celebration to continue. So Marjorie invites you, along with Christy and Ron and Heather, to join us at Minnehaha Country Club for a luncheon, and it will be a buffet. So come for as long as you, uh, as you can, stay for as long as you wish. This is a time to share stories and fellowship and further celebrate this life of an incredible man who touched us all. Let us hear again the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace I leave to you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world give, give I to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with you this day and always. To that, as God's people, we say hallelujah and amen. amen.